Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us this evening. I'm Carrie Toronto Brayman, the director of the University of Buffalo's Gender Institute and professor of English. And it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's conversation with Barbara Smith and my colleague Lillian Williams. Before we turn to the introductions, I would like to begin by acknowledging the land upon which the University of Buffalo operates, which is the territory of the Seneca Nation, a member of the Haudenosaunee Six Nations Confederacy. Today, this region is still the home to the Haudenosaunee people, and we are grateful for the opportunity to live, work, and share ideas in this territory. This evening's event will be recorded and it will be made available on the UB Gender Institute's website, as well as on our YouTube channel. The structure of tonight's event will be 30 minutes of conversation between Barbara Smith and Lillian Williams, followed by 30 minutes of Q&A. So please submit your question in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen at any point during the conversation. And we will do our best to cover as many of the questions as we can during the latter half of the event. First, let me begin by introducing my colleague and collaborator, Lillian S. Williams, who is the organizing force behind tonight's event. She is Associate Professor and Director of Community Engagement in the Department of Africana and American Studies and former Chair of the Department of African American Studies. A specialist in United States social and urban history, Professor Williams' research is in the areas of institutions, ethnicity, biography, and women's history. She is the founder of the Association of Black Women Historians and the Afro-American Historical Association of the Niagara Frontier. She has edited multiple projects, including the um, records of the NACW 1895 to 1992, and is associate editor of the 18 volume series, Black Women in US History, which laid the foundation for the study of African-American women in the academy. She is the author of Strangers in the Land of Paradise, the creation of an African-American community, Buffalo, New York, 1900 to 1940. And currently she is working on a biography of turn of the 20th century reformer, Mary Burnett Talbert. Professor Williams served as historical consultant on the New York State's Museum's permanent exhibition, Black Capital, Harlem in the 1920s, and an NAACP expert witness in a federal lawsuit. Her consultancy on a project for Girl Scouts of the USA resulted in the publication of a monograph, A Bridge to the Future, the History of Diversity in Girl Scouting. Professor Williams will be in conversation with our guest tonight, the writer, the scholar, the activist, and the visionary, Barbara Smith. The historian Robin Kelly said it best when he described Smith as one of the most important black feminists on the planet. And I still think that is an understatement. She has been at the forefront of instituting black women's studies in the university, reminding us that the class syllabus is itself a revolutionary act. She has been a longtime lesbian activist whose work reminds us that scholarship is tied to social movements and to coalition building. At the suggestion of Audre Lorde, who said to her one evening on the phone that we really need to do something about publishing, Smith founded Kitchen Table Women of Color Press, Based in Boston, Kitchen Table was committed to publishing books that promoted the writing of women of color of all classes, ages, and sexual orientations. It included such classics as Barbara Smith's own collection, Home Girls, a Black feminist anthology, as well as Sherry Moraga and Gloria Anzaldua's This Bridge Called My Back. But what Barbara Smith is most remembered for, especially at this political moment, is the Kambahi River Collective Statement which she co-wrote with her sister Beverly Smith and Demita Frazier in 1977, and is one of the most powerful manifestos ever written. It coined the phrase identity politics, and it talked about interlocking oppressions long before the term intersectionality appeared. At the root of the statement is its understanding of freedom. If black women were free, it would mean that everyone else would have to be free since our freedom would necessitate the destruction of all systems of oppression. To read this manifesto and several other classic pieces by Barbara Smith, I highly recommend her most recent book, 
ain't going to let nobody turn me around 40 years of movement building with Barbara Smith edited by Theo Jones and Virginia Eubanks with Barbara Smith and published by SUNY Press. And finally, I want to say that Barbara Smith continues to be a visionary for our times with her most recent paradigm shifting statement, the Hamer Baker plan that she has recently published in the Boston Globe and the nation. Links to those editorials and articles have been posted on the chat box. This plan named after Fannie Lou Hamer and Ella Baker would be a Marshall plan for eradicating white supremacy at a systemic level through economic interventions. We are so fortunate to have Barbara Smith with, with us this evening, and it's an honor to welcome her to Virtual Buffalo. So welcome Barbara to the Gender Institute. Good evening. I also would like to welcome you to this evening's event. It's especially meaningful to have my friend Barbara Smith visiting us at this stage, but it's also important because on this day, 108 years ago, Harriet Tubman died and George W. Bush, George W. H. Bush, uh, issued a resolution in 1990 indicating that March 10th would be Harriet Tubman Day. So I'd like to welcome you all to this evening's event and Harriet Tubman Day. Um, I'd like to begin, Barbara, by having you tell us about your journey uh, in terms of your political activism. I'll give specific questions um, if that's needed, but tell us about this journey. How did you get to where we are today? Well, first, thank you so much, Lillian, and thank you so much, uh, Carrie, if I may. Uh, I really appreciate this invitation and this opportunity made possible by, by the University at Buffalo. And I'm just uh, very uh, excited about the conversation that we uh, may very well have. At least uh, we'll have it from you, Lillian. <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> um, so I was born in Cleveland, Ohio, in the mid 20th century, 1946. And uh, whenever I talk about my political um, path, my political journey, I always make sure that people understand that when I was born, Jim Crow was very much the law and practice of the land. So I actually spent my childhood years, my growing up years, during the last decades of Jim Crow. And what that meant is that I also spent those growing up years during the uh, blossoming and the fervor of the Black freedom struggle, the civil rights movement. So that's really where I think my politics sprang from, because at a fairly early age, I began to see that life was not fair. And it was particularly and specifically not fair for Black people and people in my family. And that really made me want to be involved. Uh, it's hard, like when, when I say that I grew up as a second class citizen, people don't necessarily even, even understand what I mean uh, by that. And I won't go into a lot of details, but maybe I think what happened with that interview, that infamous or whatever famous interview that happened on Sunday with uh, people who have titles, you know, I didn't watch it because I'm not really that drawn to the problems of kajillionaires. Uh, <laughs> I figured they're not my problems, but I know that it got a lot of, uh, a lot of attention. And uh, when, yeah, the, the bombshell of the interview, as I understand it, was when uh, Meghan uh, Mar Markle talked about how there was concern about the skin color of her yet to be born first baby. And people have been up in arms about that ever since and have different, some people think it's important, some people think it's not. Some people actually uh, think that that's a fair, good and fair question to ask because they themselves are white racist and white supremacist. But that's a perfect example of what it means to be a second-class citizen. 
uh, they were treating that unborn baby in many ways by speculating about its skin color, its complexion. They were treating that baby not to, yet even born as a second class citizen based upon race. So as I said, uh, all of that really made me passionate about freedom and about justice. I got involved in the civil rights struggle in Cleveland as a teenager. And then I, when I went to college, I was politically active. There was no visible women's movement at that time, but I did go to a women's college. I went to Mount Holyoke. So all the organizing that I uh, was involved in as a student was uh, led by women, was organized by women and led by women. So um, it's kind of a, to me, it's a logical trajectory from those kinds of roots to uh, what I eventually ended up putting my, uh, my heart and soul into. So in terms of organizing, uh, talk a little bit about the Kambayi uh, River Collective and the genesis for that. Well, I'm so happy to do that. And it's so wonderful that you let people know, including myself, that you let people know that this is the death date of uh, one of the uh, creators you know, of our community, one of the people who made all of our lives possible. And that's Harriet Tubman. Uh, the Combahee River Collective is named after uh, a river in South Carolina, which I have in recent years come to know is pronounced correctly as Cumbi, as if it has two syllables and no O. <laughs> See, it's pronounced as if it spells C-U-M or K-U-M-B-E-E, -E, Cumbi. And uh, we pronounce it, have been pronouncing it incorrectly all these years. But however it's pronounced, uh, the collective that we uh, started in Boston in the mid 1970s, we had been a chapter of the National Black Feminist Organization, which was the first national organization that declared a commitment to feminism from a black standpoint. And uh, we decided at a certain point that we wanted to be an independent organization. We were, uh, we had been a part of the left all of us, the, most of us who were in the uh, group at that time had been active in organizations like the Black Panthers in trying to end the war in Vietnam, uh, the kinds of political struggles that were not merely liberal. Um, so with the, that, those kinds of politics and also with a, uh, an, an anti-capitalist and a socialist perspective, we, decided that we would become independent and we named ourselves after a raid on the Combahee River in South Carolina that was planned and organized and implemented by Harriet Tubman when she was a scout for the Union Army. That, ra uh, that raid on the Combahee River freed over 750 enslaved Africans. And that's what the collective is named after. Uh, we did organizing in Boston from the mid 70s until uh, the early 1980s. And we are best known for having written our collective statement, the Combahee River Collective Statement, where we propose that in order to actually fight the oppression that women of color face, that we have to look at all the systems of oppression that affect us, not just at some. So unlike the black liberation movement that was looking at race without taking into account gender or sexuality, I think it did take into account class. And unlike the mainstream women's movement that looked at gender without taking into account race, we wanted to look at all of the major systems of oppression. And we asserted that in our statement that was written in 1977 and the rest, I guess, is history. In, in terms of identity politics, how did you find your voice in the academy? I'm not sure that I did. 
uh, I have not pursued a traditional academic career, although I am indeed trained as an academic. That's my profession. And I have taught at many institutions, mostly in the Northeast where I've lived for many decades, but I taught at many institutions um, and also have done some interventions that seem to have had quite a bit of impact upon the uh, curriculum of colleges and universities, particularly in the field of uh, English, which is my field, but also to establish the field of Black women's studies. Um, uh, Akasha Gloria Hull and Patricia Bell Scott and I co-edited the first collection ever published in the United States that asserted that Black women's studies was actually real, that there was such a thing and that it was a legitimate thing for us to be involved in, to be pursuing. We built it. We built Black women's studies in the United States. And uh, when uh, King We've, lo we've lost her. Uh, Barbara, I'm, you're muted. I'm here. I'm here. Okay. We, we uh, lost uh, I, yeah, we, I did fade out for a second. But anyway, um, well, I was talking about how you know we built Black Women's Studies, and I was mentioning that when uh, Carrie uh, referred to that 18-volume Black Women's History um, uh, book, uh, well, it's not a book, a set, set of uh, uh, reference books that you were an associate editor for. That's the kind of thing that we were trying to make possible to happen. Mm -hmm. But in the 1970s, when we were building Black Women's Studies, and when I was teaching my first courses in Black Women Writers, uh, people did nothing but disparage. They thought that it was a waste of time. They thought that black women had never done or created anything that was of any value, certainly of no intellectual or academic value, not of any artistic value. We were just uh, nothings as far as they were concerned. Well, boy, did we prove them wrong. <laughs> we proved them wrong. But as I said, I haven't pursued a traditional academic career, but I'm very, very, very pleased and honored that the work that I've done is taught in classrooms uh, on a, has been taught in classrooms on a consistent basis from the time of that work being created until the present day. People are always letting me know that there are certain things that I've written and done that are on their syllabuses. So even if like I'm not, you know, ensconced anywhere in an institution, and haven't been for most of my life. Um, I absolutely care about the content of what students and others get to have access to. And I've done as much as I possibly could to make that a uh, reality, including being a publisher. When you look at the field of black women's studies and black feminism, how do you think that it's possible to use that knowledge to address intransigence from bureaucracies or government agencies or um, academic institutions? Uh, black feminism, at least the kind of black feminism that I've been involved in um, is a freedom agenda. It's a liberation agenda. Mm -hmm. It is an agenda it's a movement that is about more justice and about eradicating oppression. So if Black feminism has impact upon institutions like, um, like academic institutions, if Black feminism actually has impact and influences and drives the agendas of those institutions, then we are going to get to a better place because we are not going along, just we are not going along to get along. We are working for liberation. We are working for justice. We are working to have every kind of person 
who may darken the doors of these institutions, may cross the thresholds of these institutions. We are looking to have everyone who is a part of the uh, project be respected and to be uh, valued. Um, there, there's new knowledge, you know, black women studies, you know, queer studies, ethnic studies, um, you know, black, uh, you know, like uh, black futurism, I think I'm saying it incorrectly, but, you know, like looking at, you know, all of these things and all of these ways of looking at our world, this is new knowledge, you know, we're, we didn't see that like 50 or 100 years ago, although we do know that we have a tradition of uh, black women uh, who were indeed looking at uh, looking at the intersections of race and gender and class. I'm thinking about Claudia Jones in particular, but you know we can go back to the 19th century. We see people who were doing you know uh, and thinking in that way. They didn't necessarily have have an infrastructure or a movement to uplift those perspectives, but um, generally institutions are conservative. That's why they're called institutions. Generally institutions like to keep things pretty much as they are. And that's why they bring out terms like um, diversity, multiculturalism, anything except what I consider to be the real problem, which mm -hmm. If you're talking about racial oppression, is white supremacy. It's a rare academic institution that says that what they are about is dismantling white supremacy. They're not going to say that because white supremacy um, is, is, first of all, is accurate. You know that's what the system that we have here. This in the fights that were happening during the previous administration about. Uh, about uh, attacking the 1619 project, about not allowing critical race studies and critical race theory. That just shows you like how far away we are from being able to deal in a realistic way with the situations that, uh, that actually affect so many of our lives. Oh, Lillian, you're muted. Uh, I'm, I'm not, according to. I'm, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. yes. The, the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and so many others provided a woke moment. How can movements like Black Lives Matter, organizers, and other progressives sustain their movements over time? It seems that each generation we begin anew. Um, I don't think that it's a, um, it's not necessarily a negative that the same organizations, for example, that existed when I was young and getting involved in movement struggle. It's not necessarily negative that those organizations are not still active because our situation, our material conditions, the uh, way that oppression and, and injustice manifest themselves changes over time. So what was relevant around Ida B. Wells and mm -hmm. others ha um, be being you know, the anchors for anti-lynching campaigns, lynching is now in the hands of the police. So to say, if you said like, well, this is an anti-lynching organization and it's 2021 and we're working on lynching, that doesn't really make sense. But there's a through line from uh, the massive brutal brutality of, of American domestic terrorism of the 19, well, actually from 1619 on, but like after slavery ended, uh, after the civil war, that's when uh, that's when domestic terrorist, uh, domestic terrorism and domestic terrorist organizations really did uh, emerge because they were so upset and so uh, just 
furious at the idea that the animals that they had enslaved and used and abused, um, they were furious at the idea that these individuals, people like you and me, Lillian, they were uh, furious that we would have the same kinds of rights that uh, that uh, deserving white men would have. So that's when the period of white domestic terrorism uh, emerged. And of course, you know, uh, alive and well today, uh, just go back to January 6th, less than uh, about two months ago now. Um, but as I said, um, the fact that conditions change, what's logical now and what is meaningful now is to have uh, movements, the Black Lives Matter movement, the movement for Black lives, it's logical that we would focus on where the most extreme examples of violence and exploitation and oppression are happening. And that is generally vis-a-vis -vis and in the hands of the police. So it's not in any way strange or, or, or sad. We don't need to be melancholy about the fact that we don't have the same organizations now that we had 100 years ago or 50 years ago. Our work evolves, the struggle continues and the struggle evolves. Now, as far as being able to maintain that, um, I think that people have to have a global perspective about the work that they're involved in. Uh, narrow politics don't really get you anywhere. If indeed, of course you choose to work on certain issues, you can't work, uh, you can't possibly work on every issue, even those that concern you. But if you choose to work on a certain uh, realm of issues, you really do need to know what's going on in the rest of the country and the rest of the world that actually is connected to the work that you're doing. So you can be involved in uh, trying to get the police to function. Some people want to get the police to function. Some people uh, would like to see the, uh, policing abolished as we know it. I'm in the latter category. I think abolition is something we should really be taking quite seriously and working hard on because there are ways of dealing with the dysfunctions of human relationships, which is basically what the police are dealing with. They're dealing with poverty, they're dealing with anger, they're dealing with violence, they're dealing with a lot of things that are about people not being able to function well with each other. There are other approaches to that. Restorative justice would be one of those approaches, but whatever it is that you're doing, if you're focusing on policing and on the criminal justice system and on mass incarceration, you also do need to have some thought processes and some concerns about the environment. You need to have some concerns about violence against women. You need to be concerned about poverty. And what I see with the movement for black lives and the current incredibly robust wave of organizing that is being held down by people much younger um, is that they do often have that kind of intersectional perspective. And in fact, leaders like Charlene Carruthers, they say very clearly that they are doing the organizing around the issues of uh, the, the criminal injustice system, that they are doing it from a black queer feminist lens. And that being the case, that means that there's more possibility of staying power for those movements to continue. One last thing I would like to say though, is that some younger activists, and I am involved with people who are doing organizing around these issues in uh, Albany, where I reside, in the city of Albany and in the uh, capital region where there are several cities, connected to Detroit, Saratoga, et cetera. I'm involved with some of the people who are doing that organizing. Sometimes the question is raised of like, well, weren't you working on the same issues back in, you know, you know, back in your day or whatever? And, it, and, they, and they seem to think that that means that we failed. It doesn't mean we failed. It means that racial capitalism, white supremacy and patriarchy are systems of oppression and they're not going to be eradicated and demolished just like that. With every wave of organizing, we take it to another level. It's a process and uh, we just have to continue, uh, continue to work with each other, love each other and be committed to the struggle in the most serious of ways.
Oh, Lillian, I, it's muted. Muted. Sorry. Thank you so much, Barbara. I have one final question, and I think the audience has questions too, so we can get back to some of the things that you've mentioned. But I just want to know, the work that you've been doing for 50 plus years and having a commitment to it is exhausting. Um, there, it's rewarding, uh, sometimes it's disappointing, but how do you sustain yourself while engaging in this kind of work? Uh, how can we encourage our students and others to continue the struggle despite the picture that you just painted? Um, I've never done any of it alone. So that's the major, uh, that's a major pro tip, I think, that we do this work collectively. We do it as a community. We find the people who we actually enjoy being around <laughs> and feel like we can make a commitment for the long haul. And we utilize something that I refer to as our collective intelligence. No one has all of the answers to anything except for the simple stuff, you know, like you can figure out how to order groceries probably by yourself, you know, <laughs> or, or order a book or whatever. I mean, I'm not saying that we're incapable of nothing, but what mm -hmm. I'm saying is that around these big social, political, economic issues and problems, that those are solved collectively. One of my favorite articles that I recommend to people on a regular basis is in my book, Home Girls, a Black Feminist Anthology. And it's the last uh, article in the book. And it is titled Coalition Politics, Turning the Century. It's by, oh yeah, there it is. That's one of the, that's the first edition, not the second. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can always eyeball that and say, say exactly what's going on. Uh, <laughs> uh, but in any event, uh, that article, Coalition Politics Turning the Century, is by Bernice Johnson Reagan. Mm -hmm. And she is known, uh, well known, as the founder of the acapella, the peerless acapella, acapella singing group, Sweet Honey in the Rock. She gave this speech. Um, I always I need, I need to check it. Uh, I, I can never remember, was it 79 or was it 80? But it was in the, it was at the very, uh, earliest, it was the uh, late 1970s. Uh, she gave a speech at a women's music festival uh, in California. And the title of the speech was Coalition Politics Turning the Century. She was looking toward the century changing uh, uh, and, the, and also the millennium, you know, the new millennium. And she talks about what you need in order to do this work. Um, and uh, I, you know, like uh, we did see that, I did see that question, the one that you just asked, I did see it in advance. And uh, there are things that I'd like to do that have been constricted by the pandemic, uh, but I hope to be able to do some of those things again. Uh, but the major, major answer is that you don't do it by yourself. And then also, um, I'm very clear that I'm a part of a historical project. And that's a project we could call the project of people's liberation. And since I know that, I don't have to get discouraged about what didn't happen today or what might not happen tomorrow. I don't have to get discouraged because it's a, the long haul. It's people's liberation. And long after uh, I have uh, departed, uh, that work will go on. The struggle will continue. And I've done everything I, po I possibly could to leave as many breadcrumbs as I possibly could to help people in that continued struggle. So that's, you know, that's what gives me hope. I think, Lillian, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. Um, thank you again, Barbara. I'd like now to turn the session over to Carrie, uh, and we'll take questions from the audience. All right, Carrie, yeah. Hillary. Sure. Thank you so much for that wonderful conversation. Thank you, Lillian. Thank you, Barbara. 
I love that idea of leaving breadcrumbs. And mm -hmm. someone wrote in and said, which accomplishment over your career are you most proud of and why? Oh, that's a hard question because I don't usually try to think about things that way. Mm. Um, I would say that uh, what I'm most proud of is that I've made, uh, I've done everything I possibly could to maintain my integrity mm. over a lifetime. Yes. So that's not like one thing. That's not like one project. It's like the value system, yeah. uh, the value system with which I was raised and mm. also uh, the value system that uh, deepened as I got exposed to other cultures and other ways of thinking. I took a course in college that I often, well, the two courses that I consider to be the most uh, significant courses that I took as far as like how I function today. And one of them was a course in the religion department. Now, keep in mind, for those of you who are participating, uh, we're talking about the, the late 1960s. I was in college from 1965 until 1969. So it was really, it was like a different world. Yeah, we did have, uh, uh, we had, fire had been invented and there were also wheels. But other than that, it's a totally different world. <laughs> no computers, no nothing. But as I said, the course was uh, titled, maybe I didn't say it quite yet. The, the course was titled Religion, Ethics and Society. And I was drawn to that course, it was an elective. And what I found out, I found out about the difference between eth ethics and morality. And I chose ethics uh, because uh, ethics are what you have to figure out on a daily basis. Uh, you're constantly examining uh, what's the right way, what's the right thing to do. Morality is what somebody tells you to do. So morals are imposed, ethics are from within. And then the other course I took that was very important to me, uh, just so you know, this doesn't have to do with my accomplishments, was a course called Expository Writing. And mm -hmm. um, that was really a good course for me because that's what I ended up doing. <laughs> that's wonderful. I mean, when, when you're navigating that path of integrity and, and following um, your ethical practice, what questions do you ask yourself? If you're at a crossroad? Uh, one question, yeah, one question would be like, does this help anybody? Mm. And mm. also like, if it's a one-on-one -on -one, uh, situation, does this person need to hear this or know this? Often the things that you know or would like to ask, you don't have to, we have a really uh, strict culture nowadays because of social media. And it's like everything that pops into people's minds uh, is not only does it pop into their minds and not only do they say it to one person, they say it to the entire world. And we don't really have to go there. Um, and sometimes, you know, like, you know, your curiosity about something that might make someone else feel sad or uncomfortable, mm -hmm. like, you know, if you're just patient, you're probably gonna find out what you wanted to know anyway. <laughs> uh, talking about the big deal things, like whether like I feel okay about voting for uh, Democrats who run for national office, office. that's a, another discussion. I guess that's an ethical as well as a political uh, concern. Well, I think um, that question, will my actions help someone or will they hurt someone and make it less possible for them to fulfill uh, their talent and their, uh, their capacity? I want to relate to people in such a way that if possible, I can help them to reach their uh, their most firm dreams. That, in other words, like when I was teaching, for example, uh, I, and I always and I say this about political work as well. People don't respond well to you making them feel awful. 
Uh, if you want to understand something, you have to communicate in such a way that they feel feel good about what they're learning and empowered by what you're they're learning. So particularly around issues of race, but this applies to other issues too, gender, sexuality, gender mm -hmm. presentation and expression, all kinds of, uh, all kinds of issues. Um, I've always found that it works better to try to help people to think that they're capable of embracing what they don't know, as opposed to making them feel awful about what they don't know. It's a different approach. So uh, it's, it's it always worked for me. It has worked for me. Mm -hmm. Very good. I like mm -hmm. that. There's, on a related note, um, someone has asked Anna Grushik, how do you explain that on the one hand, we have all sorts of progressive ideas and methods in the academic departments now. Uh, but on the other hand, we have administrators with six figure salaries and an army of poverty wage teaching staff. What do you think is the root or is at the root of this apparent structural contradiction? Mm. Mm. Well, that's an easy question for me. <laughs> uh, the problem is that these are uh, educational institutions under capitalism. So they are organized the way that you would expect a capitalist institution of higher learning to be organized. Uh, more and more, uh, particularly our big universities are run like corporations and like businesses. The presidents of these institutions are often hired not for their intellectual depth or for their deep commitment to student learning. They're hired because they can uh, raise money. And why do they need to raise money to that degree? It's because they're academic institutions under capitalism. And we don't have the kind of society, although we do have some funding for education. Uh, notice how during this pandemic year that it's uh, the small, not uh, marquee named institutions, some of them have closed because there's a place called Harvard, you know, that's sitting on top of, go, uh, uh, on top of Fort Knox, you know? Uh, and there are other institutions like that. There are some very prestigious institutions that don't have those kinds of funds. And then there are others that are educating the majority of our young people and they're having real problems. And why? Education <laughs> under capitalism. Simple as that, simple as that, and miserable as that. Now, if you go to some other countries, uh, even uh, countries that are more similar to us than, than, than you might think, and thinking about Western European countries, you will see that their education systems are funded totally differently, and the assumptions about who can access them are quite different than here. Mm -hmm. So, um, the, the exploitation, that exploitation of, of adjunct faculty and that exploitation of non-academic staff that keep that institution running, that is typical of how a capitalist institution works. Whether it's a factory, a hospital, or a college or university, you see similar dynamics because capitalism is about one thing and that's making a profit. So even universities and colleges that generally are not for profit, not that they're, but they're it's not that they're for profit institutions, but they are institutions under that kind of a system. And that needs to change, doesn't it? Hmm. It does. It does. And as you say in your wonderful collection of essays here, when you graduated from college, you had very little in debt. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's something that really has happened uh, in the in the post Reagan era with this intensification of student debt and loans right. and increases mm -hmm. in tuition rate. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. So Someone wrote in asking about, let me just see. Thank you so much for the presentation. Barbara Smith mentioned the tradition of black women who looked at the intersections of gender, race, and class, among them Claudia Jones. I wondered if she referred to the movement Mary Helen Washington describes as black left feminism, 
Was this tradition a source of inspiration for you when you founded the Combi River Collective? I knew very little about that history. Um, I mean, I'm being perfectly honest. I generally am. One of my books is called The Truth That Never Hurts, <laughs> Writings on Race, Gender, and Freedom. So I'm generally known for not pulling punches around this kind of subject matter. Um, so I knew very little about that uh, tradition of the Black left uh, and Black left uh, women. I did have the thought process in the early 1980s when I moved to New York City from Boston and we were starting Kitchen Table Women of Color Press. I had recently found out that the incredible genius uh, Lorraine Hansberry, playwright, writer, just a woman for the ages, I recently found out that she had written, uh, written letters to the latter that is, uh, and that was an early lesbian publication. And so that made me know more about her than I knew already from being familiar with her incredible uh, uh, work. And I used to think like, wow, I wish Lorraine Hansberry was still alive because then I could talk to her. I might be able to talk to her and ask her, what the hell <laughs> we tried to do? What the hell should we be doing? Um, I had the fortune, the incredible fortune of meeting Fannie Lou Hamer uh, when I was a teenager in Cleveland. And the reason I had that good fortune is not because I won a contest or something like that. It's because I was in the movement. I was active in the civil rights movement in Cleveland and she was invited to come to a rally. We had a very robust civil rights movement in Cleveland and in the spring of 1965, she came and I actually got to not only see her speak, but amazingly, I'm a twin. So my sister and I obviously are exactly the same age and she was very involved as well, my sister Beverly. And we got invited after Fannie Lou Hamer spoke to a grown up party <laughs> uh, where the you know people who were involved, you know, uh, core people, I was in core, the Congress of Racial Equality, actually. But when I say core people, I meant people who were essentially involved in organizing. Someone asked if we wanted to come to this party where Fannie Lou Hamer was going to be. So not only did I get to see her speak, I actually got to see her in a small space. And I, I know that my sister and I said some really appreciative words to her. I don't know if she would define herself as a part of the left. I think legitimately she uh, is. And uh, I never... I did not know about Ella Baker until um, probably the 1980s. I was not aware of her. I certainly knew about SNCC, uh, mm -hmm. the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. So I didn't really know that much about um, our ancestors. What was fortunate uh, with the Combahee River Collective, there is a person in the Combahee River Collective named Sharon Burke, who was in her 40s when the rest of us were in our 20s or 30s. And she had had a lot of experience in the black left. And the fact that she was a part of the collective, that really had a huge amount of impact on our understandings and on our politics. So as opposed to looking elsewhere, there was actually someone in our group that had uh, those years of experience and really offered much guidance to us. Very good. You know, you speak about a continuum in your work and sort of passing knowledge down generationally. And those are two powerful examples. Somebody wrote in asking, uh, if you were to rewrite the Combi River Collective statement today, would, what changes would you make? Uh, vir virtually none. <laughs> That's so funny. I have to laugh because um, there was a tweet today, earlier today, this very day, that around Women's History Month was asking, what's your favorite quote from the Combahee River Collective statement? Now, they weren't asking me in particular, but I responded uh, in answer to your question, and I put it in all, all caps. I said, all of them? All of it. <laughs> the whole thing. The whole thing is my favorite. Go figure, you know? 
Would it be because I wrote it? Who knows? But be that as it may, be that as it may, there is one thing I would try to explain a little bit more, which is at the end of the statement, we uh, uh, there's a quote from Robin Morgan, um, who was and still is a, a, a significant second wave feminist. And she had written in something that she had no idea but possible, uh, I think, I don't know if it's contribution, but what possible uh, kind of revolutionary contribution white men could make. Oh, I think the screen, oh, we, oh no, oh, there's, Barbara, come back. Yeah, yeah I'm back, I'm back. A bit of glitch feminism. Can right you hear now. me? Yes. Yes. I'm back. Um, anyway, um, I was talking about white men. Do you think that had anything to do with it? Anyway, <laughs> um, so she made this statement about, uh, as I said, we were quoting how she was raising the question of like what the possible purpose that white men could play in you know, our, you know, burgeoning uh, feminist uh, movement. And then we, uh, if white men, it was kind of like, uh, I can't remember what, that is, is an analogy. I don't know what that is. Like when you compare things uh, by uh, kind of in opposition to each other. So we were basically saying, well, if white men don't have a revolutionary purpose and black women might be considered to be their opposite number, then we definitely have a revolution, revolutionary purpose. And that's what uh, was near the end of the statement. I would either take that out or either explain it much more clearly because um, even at the time, I don't think that we were saying that we thought that white men had nothing to contribute to struggle. I think that it was just a little too clever by half to use that as a way of saying, if white men, uh, if, if, if there's a question about whether they can contribute, then us as their opposite numbers obviously have a lot to contribute. I would definitely uh, do something about that. And I've said that before. This is not the first time that I've referred to that, but everything else uh, is cool with me. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, you have- I no think. Go ahead. Um, Hillary's posted that Robin Morgan quote in the chat box. Gwen Thomas asked, could you offer your insights into coalition building, particularly around political organizing or running for political office, which you have done in Albany for city council? What, what advice do you have? Um, I, I don't know that I really have uh, anything that's particularly unique uh, about coalition building. I learned so much by getting involved in electoral politics with my politics that I maintained. Um, I got to meet different kinds of people who I would never have had the opportunity to get to know had I stayed in my um, comfortable mm -hmm. uh, lesbian feminists of color kind of context, left lesbian feminists of color context. I got to meet lots of different kinds of people. I certainly represented a ward that had uh, lots of issues and uh, concerns. Uh, a poor, you know, I live in a uh, a poor black community to this day. And that's a community that I represented. I had a very diverse ward. I also had the, the richest ED electoral district in the entire city was also in my ward. <laughs> but as I said, those people did not call me very much because they didn't really have any problems that I could solve. But be that, be that as it may, um, I think the fact that I was open to the uh, possibilities and one of the things that I did that you know people might disagree with, there are people who ran for office subsequently who are well known, who ran very clearly uh, with their politics. They were running in a different kind of context. I'm thinking about uh, Alexandra uh, Ocasio-Cortez in particular, but the entire squad uh, and, and their new members of the squad now with the new Congress. But for me, um, I didn't hide my politics, but I also did not beat people over the head with them because 
from what I could see, people didn't really care about that stuff. I mean, on the common councils slash city council level, they, they call it the common council here. On the common council level, people are calling you about potholes and sidewalks, getting sidewalks fixed and traffic lights and all kinds of basic everyday things. I can't tell you how often I went to school meetings, that is meetings in principal's offices with constituents. Now I was good at that because, you know, I feel quite confident in educational settings given, you know, my background. And I was really happy to be able to go with uh, parents to meet with people at the school around their children. And as I said, I, I did that, you know, that was, that's not in the job description for being a council member, but I feel like as a black woman um, and a black woman clearly who by the time I ran had had some life experience because I ran uh, when I was in my late fifties, um, I think that people recognize that, well, yeah, maybe I can call the council woman and maybe she'll go with me to deal with this situation at the school that I'm not really getting anywhere with. And uh, as I said, those are the kinds of things that people were concerned about. They didn't care that I was uh, a black radical, <laughs> uh, uh, lesbian feminist who had a lot of books with her name on them. That, that, they weren't concerned about that. Sometimes they found out about it and they were very happy. They were delighted actually. Some wonderful things happened when they would find out, but I didn't really see that as like relevant to what we were trying to accomplish, which was justice and uh, rights for people in my district. That's what I was working on. So my politics, you know, whatever they were, uh, I did not leave them at the door because I functioned with them. Like everything I did was based on my political understandings and my political values and commitments. I just didn't say, well, you know, as a socialist, uh, the fact that, you know, uh, you're being exploited at this workplace. I didn't, I didn't need to say that. <laughs> I just need to try, needed to try to help them. I think that we're getting close to our end time. And there is something that I had wanted to talk about that cool. hasn't quite come up. Yeah, please. So I know that there are probably a lot of questions, but I assume that we want to keep this to the appointed time too. Absolutely. Please go ahead, Barbara. Please. Okay. So what I wanted to make sure that I got to talk about is um, the fact that I wrote these, they've been mentioned, that I wrote four articles uh, following George Floyd's lynching. I, uh, the first one I wrote, I started a few days that very week that he was murdered. Uh, about white supremacy. So I have now written not one, not two, but not three, but four different articles since late May of last year about white supremacy. Three of them published in the Boston Globe and one of them published in The Nation. And the reason I started writing those articles, I did not know there would be that many of them, but the reason I started is because I felt that people were getting the conversation and the discussion all wrong, that people need to understand that the system is white supremacy, that is what we're up against, and until we deal with that, face it, name it, face it, and, and decide to eradicate it, we're not going to get anywhere. Uh, the second article that I uh, wrote that was published in The Nation uh, is, uh, uh, the title is How to Dismantle White Supremacy. I did say dismantle, and we talked, I think, about the Hamer Baker plan, a Marshall plan to get rid of white supremacy. These are thought experiments. Uh, the, a lot of the things that I do, the third one that I wrote was a speech for Joe Biden <laughs> that he could deliver about white supremacy. So that was, you know, clearly these are thought experiments. But the thing is that I want, but the, these are thoughts I want people to be considering. So mm -hmm. Not many, many people, most people will not talk about white supremacy. They prefer systemic racism, discrimination, racism, prejudice, whatever. But those, even if they do talk about white supremacy, they certainly do not talk about the possibility that it could be ended. It mm -hmm. could be ended if indeed the political will existed to do so. 
And until that day, we'll be grappling with a lot. But um, I, you know, I put out proposals, just like very, very general proposals about the kinds of things we could do if indeed the society as a whole decided like enough of this misery, enough of this violence, enough of this destruction, let's end it. It had a beginning, it could have an end. So that's what I've been doing. And then I wrote one, the most recent one was about uh, the white supremacist lynch mob at the Capitol. That one was published in January. Where in the nation or the Boston Globe? All of them were in the Boston Globe except for the second. So three have been in the Boston Globe. One, numbers one, three, and four. The second one was in the nation. And they're powerful pieces. I have here the one from the nation in which you spell it out. You demystify the solution. You're saying we need to approach and dismantle racial capitalism. Could you define that? concept for our viewers and, and just a, a briefly before we sign off that that is really the core of this manifesto in large part well racial capitalism that's not an original idea with me right um and i i think that it is attributed to um at least to a group of thinkers if not to one i don't know who the first person is who used the term um but as I said, it's not an original concept with me, but what it reflects is that in the United States, the form of capitalism that we have is absolutely entwined with and informed by the fact that, it's a, that this is a white supremacist country, mm -hmm. that white supremacy built the form of capitalism that we have. It built the wealth of this country and that you cannot really think about one without thinking about the other. That's what racial capitalism is. And there's some people, capitalism, let me just say this, capitalism is not liking nice things. Capitalism is not having a shoe closet, you know, just for shoes, you know, <laughs> your 100 or 50 pairs of shoes or whatever. That's not capitalism. Capitalism is a, uh, econo an economic system, a political economic system that organizes how uh, the economy is run and how uh, products and services are produced. That's what capitalism is. Um, there are people who think that capitalism is uh, being highly materialistic. You might be more likely to be materialistic under capitalism, but that's not what capitalism is. Capitalism is the fact that uh, what we were talking about earlier, the fact that there are people at universities and at colleges who are making high six figures and that the people who are actually delivering the education are barely uh, paid and are barely able to get by. It's a system. Mm -hmm. Very good. And, and Cedric Robinson is the one who coined racial capitalism, who I think he passed away about two years ago. Yes. Cedric Robinson. Thank you so much, Barbara. I think that's a powerful way to end and to encourage our audience to keep reading your work. And you truly are a visionary. And these essays really spell out the concrete ways we can get beyond the times we're living in. So thank you. And Lillian, I'm so grateful to you for bringing Barbara to all of us to Buffalo virtually. And thank you so much for engaging her in conversation. It was terrific. Thank you. And thank you all. And, I, just, I, and I want to say thank you too. <laughs> also want to thank all of those who were supporting us, Dave, Hillary, um, Audrey, thanks again for your support. And we'll see you next week when Dr. Uh, Brenda Moore will be giving a lecture on African-American women in the military in World War II. Terrific. All right. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Good evening, everybody.